Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first Facebook Live video and my first Facebook Live tour. Um, I am excited to be doing this. Uh, I'm Kevin Adkison, the curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research, and uh, we have been doing a few of these live tours over on our Instagram page, um, but I thought that we would reach new audiences by coming over here to Facebook Live. So next week we're going to be sending out an email to all of Cranbrook um, with instructions on how to watch these. And so you, my lucky followers, have found us uh, on our test tour. Um, I might should have chosen a less iconic thing to tour than these sculptures here um, for a test, but I wanted to make sure that this worked before we blasted out that Facebook live tours were going to be a weekly occurrence for the duration of um, the Cranbrook closure and the, the world closure. So I am the curator with Cranbrook's Center for Collections and Research, which is our division of historic properties, outdoor sculptures, um, historic collections, personal effects, as well as Cranbrook archives. And today I'm standing here at Cranbrook Art Museum over my shoulder. And I thought that we would talk a little bit about the sculptures that are around the outside of Cranbrook Art Museum. And uh, this building was built to be the art museum for the Cranbrook Academy of Art students. So it was uh, built as a teaching museum. And originally it housed the collection of George Booth and his wife Ellen Booth, our founders. Um, and it was a pretty encyclopedic collection going from ancient Greek and Roman art all the way up through the Impressionist and uh, into the arts and crafts movement. Today, the museum is still part of the Academy of Art, but it's a museum of contemporary art. The building itself was designed by Cranbrook's main architect, Aliel Saarinen, and it was his last building, completed in 1942. And the sculptures uh, came from a number of different artists, but many of them, most of them, were by Cranbrook's most famous sculptor, Carl Millis. And so we'll start um, here with Millis's Orpheus Fountain. And, oh, and the sun is going to come out, perhaps. Uh, Millis was a Swedish sculptor who uh, studied in France with Auguste Rodin. Uh, and he was a, a pretty uh, successful student of Rodin. He goes back to Sweden and he starts his sculpture studio. And he really gets international acclaim. Uh, and so by, you know, 1915, 1920, Millis is one of the most famous sculptors in the world. And when Cranbrook Academy of Art began, uh, we had an English sculptor here, David Evans, and then Evans left. And George Booth and Aliel Saarinen really wanted to get the Swedish um, uh, sculptor Millis to come to Cranbrook. But Millis refused to come to Cranbrook. He had a sweet gig in Sweden. He had an island uh, or, or a, a part of an island in, in Stockholm Harbor where he worked. He also was a fellow at the American Academy in Rome and he didn't have a need to come to America and teach. And so he declined to move to, to Cranbrook. Um, George Booth kept trying, kept trying, and finally he cornered Millis at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Millis was having a retrospective and he sort of asked Millis, what would it take to get you to Cranbrook? And Millis said, I would want to feel at home, uh, I would want to have assistance, and I would want to um, not teach. And so George Booth met those demands. Uh, he'd never, Millis never taught here. He simply critiqued and he ran his studio. But sometimes he was only at Cranbrook for one month out of 12. Um, he was never here more than six or seven months a year. Uh, he continued residing in Sweden, Rome, and then Cranbrook. And then he also had assistants here, and he had a number of different staff or faculty members who would actually teach the students, and then assistants who would work on the plaster models. And then he also wanted to feel at home, and George Booth did that by purchasing from Millis's studio um, 
a group of about um, 46 bronzes. And so many of the bronzes that are around Cranbrook's campus by Millis were actually purchased in 1930 in order to convince Millis to come to Cranbrook. And so when Sarnen, the architect, uh, invited Millis uh, here, or, or when he started building the buildings, he already owned all these sculptures and he knew where to place them. Now, the Orpheus Fountain is a little different. This one was sculpted here at Cranbrook. It was not sculpted for Cranbrook. It was sculpted for the new Stockholm Music Hall, um, the main symphony hall in downtown Stockholm. Uh, these are at half scale of the final project. Uh, and this is called the Orpheus Fountain, uh, but it is actually missing Orpheus. So in the original, there would be a 38 foot tall figure of Orpheus, the god of music. And Millis, uh, like most of his sculptures, was depicting a classical scene here. Um, uh, and so Orpheus was a musician who would awaken snakes and rocks uh, and all the sort of woodland creatures uh, to come and dance with him using his lyre. His wife Eurydice was bitten by a serpent, went to the underworld, and Orpheus descended into the underworld to try and find his wife. Um, and he began playing his lyre, and Hades uh, was charmed by the music of Orpheus as well as the other creatures of the underworld. So these are underworldlings who are being awakened by Orpheus, and so you see them turning in and listening to the music. And these are all cast bronze, hollow cast bronze sculptures. It is a fountain. It is still freezing weather, so we don't have the fountains turned on. Now, the people who served as the models for this sculpture grouping were Cranbrook students. So only two are identified. This was one of Millis's sculpture students here, and he's holding the little bird there. Now, you'll see on the bronze uh, the seam. So they are cast in two parts, and they were originally cast with no weep holes. And so famously during the winter, um, if water and moisture would get in the body of the sculpture, and then it would cause them as the water pooled down here and had no way to weep, um, it would uh, freeze the sculpture and the entire thing would sort of rise up off of its uh, anchor. And then when the winter was over, they would go back down. They've been rehoused or reattached and now no longer fly up and down in the winter. Now, of these sculptures, they are all unidentified figures, um, except for one over here is Beethoven. And Beethoven was Millis's favorite uh, musician. And this is Beethoven after he has gone death, deaf. And so uh, in the original in Stockholm, all of the figures are like her and they're all looking towards um, Orpheus because they hear the music from the center of the fountain and they look towards Orpheus. Uh, Beethoven, though, he is looking out because he can't hear uh, Orpheus's music. And so his arms are raised in agony. And I think if I get a little to the side, it is hard to tell, but he does look like Beethoven. Um, now, when Sarnin decided that this sculpture grouping from 1937 would be in front of his museum, which was finished in 1942, he doesn't want to have Orpheus in there at all because those columns on the art museum are about 40 feet high and the Orpheus is 38 feet high. And so he knew proportionally it would never work to have Orpheus dominating these columns. Uh, and so when uh, Millis, he, he agreed to that, that was fine. But he then turned the head of our fountains because he thought it would look strange if everyone in the fountain group was staring towards the inside of spraying water. And so our figures are actually all looking in different directions and sort of just dancing here. Now, the next sculpture uh, is not by Millis. These lynxes are by the Finnish sculptor and taxidermist, Jussi Montanen. Uh, and he sculpted these around 1937. They're in black Finnish granite and they were purchased by um, uh, Aelil, Sar or Aelil Saarinen when he was in Finland for this spot. And so you see it's the mother lynx and her charge. Um, the Finnish name for these sculptures translates to motherhood. 
On this side, we see some cleaning that needs to be done from the birds. They have this really charming little nestle of the lynx and then the face of the sculpture. And so these frame the one entrance up to the art museum. Uh, you may not have known originally all of these bricks here. This would have been hand cut grass. And so all of these were concrete pavers with then uh, grass growing in between them. There's Beethoven again. Now, as we move up to the museum, it does have four different ways of entering. Uh, so this would be the next way, the ramp of the Chinese dog, which is uh, coming up from what's now the parking lot. It also is linking back to the Booth Manor home. Uh, and so the Booth Manor home is that red roof building out there. The blue tarps, we're doing some wall restoration between here and there. And the sculpture that was placed on this pedestal is the Chinese dog from the Wei Dynasty. So about 300 to 500. But we have to cover up all of our stone sculptures in the winter because you don't want, you know, nothing can happen to the bronze. That can't be hurt by frozen water. But a stone sculpture like my dog here, if the water gets in and freezes, it could crack open the 1500 year old sculpture. And so we cover them with very drab covers. And one of the Cranbrook Academy of Art students uh, wrote to us and asked if she could do her sculpture installation on top of our sculpture cover. And so this is a contemporary work um, by a student at Cranbrook Academy of Art in conversation with the 1500 year old Chinese lion or shishi figure. And these guard lions um, were usually placed at the entrance of royal homes and uh, government buildings. And so here you have Cranbrook being protected by one of these Chinese lions. And one of my very favorite views of Cranbrook is to, to walk through this great gateway and portal and past the Chinese lion. It's interesting, Saarinen designed all the sculpture bases. So this uh, lovely little Kaima rector, uh, uh, Saima recta, curve is coming from the architect and then the sculpture rests on top of Saarinen's base. I think from a conservation standpoint, um, I wish he had placed the, the, the Chinese dragon a little bit further under uh, because the acid rain will eventually just cause him to disintegrate. He's made of black marble and quartz. Now as we move closer in. If you've never had the pleasure of visiting us here at Cranbrook, um, the art museum is only half of this building. Um, the library is the other half. And then behind me is the new art museum's collections wing. And that building opened in 2011. It houses the majority of the art museum's collection, but it also houses uh, the community's collection. So pieces from Cranbrook schools, valuable objects from Cranbrook House and Gardens, as well as the Cranbrook Archives reading room is located in the wing there. Now, the next sculpture that we'll look at is Ingelbrecht. And Ingelbrecht uh, was a medieval Swedish national hero. He defeated the invading um, Danes and Norwegians and he defended Sweden. So this is a sculpture from 1926, 27, and it has sort of Swedish scenes, uh, medieval scenes. Millis, his, his predominant sculptures uh, were usually biblical, Greek or Roman, or Swedish medieval stories. And I wish I knew more about either Swedish history or exactly what was going on here, but there are, it is a sort of narrative moving around the base of Ingelbrecht. And then he has this fabulous sword up above his head and he has the sort of chain link armor. And again, placed here, not sculpted for here, but placed here by Eliel Saarinen, the architect. And so you see the integration of Saarinen's design for the sculpture base, and then these pilasters of Mankato limestone within the brickwork. And then that ventilation, or the, the brickwork that looks like ventilation, that's actually a window into the original um, 
art museum closet, storage closet, right at the front door. Now, the next sculpture that we'll see, well, let's talk a little bit about these strange runes. So I'll do another walking tour where we talk about the architecture of these buildings. Um, but these elements that are sort of carved into the building, these stone columns are load-bearing, so there's no steel behind these columns. This is not surface. These are blocks of Mankato limestone. And Sarnen designed these very abstract architectural ornaments as a way of sort of linking the building to the past, to architecture history, and linking it towards um, a more classical ornament. I think also creating visual interest, because everyone who sees these buildings wonders what they are. Um, they are fully abstract, though many people see a signature here, E.S. Alial Saarinen. I don't know if I buy it, but I see it. Um, but they do add this sort of nice sort of mid-dimension between the scale of the architecture and the materials to then the figural sculptures of Millis that ornament serves as a link between those two scales. Now the next sculpture on the other side is the horse head of the folk fiber and the folk or fi bitter, a uh, Phil bitter, I have no idea how to say his name, another Swedish um, medieval hero. We'll talk more about him on the other side of the building. Uh, but this is just one portion of a larger fountain made for a Swedish municipality. But notice how on the Ingelbrecht side, it, it was the one knight with two pilasters. Now we have the horse head with four pilasters behind him. So the building's not perfectly symmetrical. On that side, you have the long brick wall with the narrow sculpture grouping. On this side, you have the wider sculpture and then the wall of windows into the library reading room. And so Millis, this is actually the full size of the final fountain, but it's only the horse head. So we'll see the full sculpture on the other side of the building. Uh, but here, Millis, what he would often do in order to raise more funds and to, uh, you know, get his work further out there would be to make the single sort of cast of individual elements. So the Sarnins had in their personal collection the figure of one of the dancing girls over at Kingswood. And so Millis here is, is sort of decapitating the horse and letting it stand on its own as its own sculpture. And one of the students at the academy actually sculpted this entire horse head, reproduced it uh, in clay, and it was really quite an amazing project. Again, the base is designed by Aelil Sarnen, and this time it is hiding the restrooms for the library uh, are down here, and so this grate allows windows to cut in, and Sarnen cleverly conceals it so that you have the sort of grass this clean edge of the grass running up to the library building. You would never know that there's a lower level. Where he needs windows into the lower level, he hides it with the sculpture pedestal. Let's see, who's next? Well, we have the great uh, bronze cast doors by Saarinen. This is St. Paul. Uh, technically, I guess this would be Saul, who is being struck by the Lord in the Book of the Apostle. And so he is being kicked off of his horse by the blinding light. Um, and that light actually exists. So there's a little light bulb up there and there's a convex lens that shoots a single beam down onto the sculpture at night and sort of mirroring the instability that Saul must have felt. The whole horse is sort of resting on this tiny little funny shaped base. And one of my favorite things in Cranbrook Archives is a drawing that actually shows a tracing of this base full scale and then Saarinen's drawing for what the base has to look like because you see it as a very unusual shape around the sides. And this sculpture, which is the full scale, uh, really shows Millis's hand, the way he's working with the clay and then the plaster before it's cast in bronze. And then Paul's face there, the shock. Now, moving across the hairstyle, we have 
one of my favorite elements, which is the lantern that Sarnen designed to shoot light up onto the ceiling and reflect it back into the space so that at night this entire peristyle really glows with warmth. Instead of just being lit by the lights in the ceiling shining down, Sarnen shines the light up out of this um, sculptural lantern and it illuminates the blue ceiling and softly shines it back down. Now the doors into the museum and library um, are 500 pounds of solid cast bronze, cast in Long Island City, Queens, New York. Um, and they have this great green patina that was, uh, uh, is given to the doors and has to be maintained to keep them that color, but where the handholds touch, uh, it, it turns the shiny bronze. A very different technique with bronze would be this sculpture by Harry Bertoia. Uh, Harry Bertoia was an Italian metalsmith who immigrated to Detroit in 1930, started his career in America at the College of Creative Studies uh, when it was still known as the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts. And then he came to Cranbrook in 1937 as a student. In 39, he reopened the silver shop and became an instructor in silversmithery. And he stayed here until 1943. This piece is from 1962. And by this point, Bertoia had left the sort of world of fine silver and was working more in sound sculptures. He was working in furniture. He was also working in uh, sort of abstract experiments in metal. And so this is bronze, and it's done by a technique called spill casting. And with spill casting, Bertoia would take a sort of bed of sand, and then he would pour molten bronze onto the bed of sand. And whatever shape resulted, that was the sculpture. So it's... A, it's a little bit Pollock-esque. Um, I should say I am a architecture historian, not an art historian, uh, but this idea of eliminating the hand, eliminating the sort of artist um, intent, very different than Millis's bronze sculptures here. Um, one technique that they would, that uh, Bertoia would do in these spill castings is that he would take water and other chemicals and while the bronze was still molten he would spray the water onto the piece and so some of these reactions are from the uh, water uh, sort of exploding onto the molten bronze pieces and I think it's interesting to compare um, this Bertoia to then the bronze doors of Saarinen, because the way that Saarinen's craftsmen created this is sort of fundamentally the exact same technique. Uh, these pieces, the designs would have been carved in wood, and then they would have been finished with uh, perhaps fine plaster in order to smooth out any wood grain. And then the doors, having been made in wood and plaster, would be taken and pressed into a bed of molding sand. And then uh, the bronze would have been poured into the pressed sand design and then lifted out. And it would have been done for both sides of the doors and then bolted together. So both of these are sort of iterations on sand casting bronze. If we're asking for any editorial, one of them's better than the other, but I didn't say it. Um, I mentioned the folk fiber. Um, again, Sarnen hates perfect symmetry, so you'll notice he does not stand directly in front of the column. He's a little bit to the right. I think that's done so that when you're looking up at the museum, they have a more sort of dynamic relationship. The Folk Fi uh, Filbiter, I really have no idea how to say his Swedish name, uh, another medieval character, and it was a battle between Christian monks and the heathens. Um, the folk is a heathen, and his grandson was abducted by a roving gang of medieval Swedish monks. And so he spent the next 25 years of his life searching for his grandson. And this is the folk uh, at the end of his life, near the end of his life, as an old man. And so he is wandering through the wilderness, searching for his grandson still. And you'll notice the head here is the head from the front of the art museum. 
And so why would Millis have sculpted at all these different scales? Uh, well, when you're working in sculpture, you, you start at, with these smaller studies and then you work your way up. For someone with Millis's skill, the studies are as you know, beautiful and as accomplished as the final piece. And the final piece is huge. And so Millis would have his little studies transferred from clay into plaster and then cast in bronze to sell. This is something that's much more easy to sort of collect than the original, which was massive. So we saw the, the head on the other side of the museum. Down here is a full size of folk five, uh, folk's head. Uh, so this is the full size. Imagine he is sitting on the um, horse still and then sprayed with water. And the original is a fountain group. And so here you see the grandfather, he then searching for his son. I love the base that Sarnen designed uh, here. It looks to me like an anvil, which goes back all the way to George Booth, who was an iron worker, Cranbrook. Uh, you know, one of our great strengths is our metals department. It has always been here since 1928, a department of, black, of metal smithing. And so the fact that this bronze sculpture would sit on a sort of abstract stone anvil is very evocative to me. Now, Millis loved putting his sculptures on tall posts like this. In fact, uh, Millis's wife, Olga Millis, used to say, no matter how little money we have, Carl always seems to find money uh, for another Roman column because Millis didn't like to just put his sculptures on columns, but he liked to put them on ancient columns. And so if you ever have the chance to go to Stockholm and tour his uh, estate, which is owned by the Swedish people, uh, you'll see that he put most of his sculptures on Roman columns. And I think it's funny that uh, here at Cranbrook, yes, it's on a column, but the, what Millis actually liked about having the sculptures high up was to look at them in the abstract, to see them against the sky. And so Sarnin puts it on a column, but then he runs it right next to the building. Uh, what Millis would have preferred would have been something like this, where you would see the sculpture uh, all the way around 360 degrees against the sky. More ventilation. Now our Marshall Frederick sculptures are wrapped up. So assuming that Cranbrook is closed for quite a while, it will be June 14th is our hopeful day of reopening the museum. Um, I will do another live tour and we'll talk about the stone sculptures that we can't see at the moment. I want to end with the last two sculpture groupings here at the Art Museum though. The Bull and Europa and the Tritons. And both are sculpture groupings, not singular sculptures. Uh, the Bull in Europa here was sculpted for a town in Sweden in the late 1930s. Um, and it is the tale of the Phoenician uh, Europa, who Zeus fell in love with, but he could not reveal himself as a god to the human Europa. And so instead he transformed himself into a white bull and joined Europa's father's herd of cows and bulls. And Europa found the bull so dashing, she fell in love with the bull. And here she is after climbing aboard to ride Zeus. And then Zeus sprints away from Phoenicia and uh, runs off to Crete, where he reveals himself to be Zeus and transforms Europa into a god. And so here they are, that classic tale in the tender moment as she reaches out to his tongue. It's a weird sculpture to have as your icon, but a beautiful sculpture to have. Uh, and there are four of these in existence, um, two in Sweden, one here at Cranbrook, and one at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, um, which I saw for the first time when I was driving back from my uh, home in, in north of Atlanta and went to look at the architecture of UT Knoxville, popped out of a parking structure, and there the Bull and Europa were on top of the parking deck. I will say of the four locations, this is the best, uh, the best sort of placement. The next part of the sculpture grouping was actually down here. Um, there are two pieces that we are waiting to restore 
how they connect, um, but it was part, a sort of three-part sculpture. So they're little uh, sort of fish-like creatures that go here, and hopefully those will be back soon. The next pieces are the triton and fishes. So there's a fish. Now, once the water gets back on, we clean out the fountains. Millis would have had the water just absolutely flying. He always wanted more water, more water. Um, we keep the water rather tame these days. Um, but the fish are sort of uh, in celebration or in supporting role to the tritons. And the tritons are half man, half dolphin. Uh, and they play their conch shell horns in order to control the weather. So they control the seas, the climate of the seas, through their conch horns. And each of the four tritons are different. Um, you'll see that they also spray water. And so you have the ones happy, happy tritons, angsty tritons. Um, and then, of course, the, the pools head down to the original gates of Cranbrook there. And so you end up with this really beautiful setting. I think much more beautiful than any of the original settings in Sweden, where the tritons and their shells, the fishes, the bull in Europa, create this movement from the steps of the art museum out across the campus. My favorite fun fact that is just kind of unbelievable is that when George Booth was ready to extend the, the campus of Cranbrook Academy of Art, which started at that end of the campus at Lone Pine Road and grew from 1928 to 1930, uh, that's Millis's own house of 1930 there, Millis's studio of 1931 and Millis's studios of 33, all the way to the painting studios of 36 to 38, Around 38, George Booth was ready to build the museum. The design was pretty much set, but he did not have the funds to start construction. He was still suffering from the Great Depression. And so uh, he decided to, instead of waiting, holding off on everything, to build what he called at the time the formal gardens of Cranbrook Academy of Art. And he actually constructed all of these pools, got the sculptures in place, on both sides of the museum. So he went ahead and built the Orpheus Fountain, he built the Triton Pools, uh, and then when he had saved up enough money, had the financing secure, began constructing the art museum directly between fully planted gardens with the fountains on, flowers blooming, and then a construction site at sort of 80 feet between the two of them. It's a strange way to build. I'm not sure you could find a contractor who would agree to do it today. Um, they did do it successfully. These are the original fountains, the original bases. Like everything at Cranbrook, they're probably the most overbuilt way you could get a fountain. Uh, and so luckily they don't uh, leak. Originally until 2017, it was fresh water from the city of Bloomfield Hills that was sprayed out of the fountains and then it drained into our water system. They now recirculate, but that's really about the only change that's happened to this really glorious arrangement of sculpture, architecture, and landscape. So thanks so much for joining me on my first Facebook Live tour with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. I hope that everyone is doing well and that everyone is healthy or uh, and, and has plenty of food and plenty of things to do. Um, thanks to all of our healthcare workers out there and Thanks for staying home and doing your part. I will stay at my home here at Cranbrook and try and bring you more beautiful things every Wednesday at five o'clock. If you are on Instagram, we're also doing shorter little tours on Instagram Live Tuesday and Thursday at five o'clock. So thanks for following along and I will see you next Wednesday.